Welcome to the Money Answer Show with host Jordan Goodman. Whether you are starting out, deep into your retirement, or somewhere in between, the Money Answer Show has the know-how to help you. Now here's your host, Jordan Goodman. Welcome to the Money Answer Show. This is Jordan Goodman, your host. My guest for this half hour is David Scranton. He's the president and founder of Advisors Academy and also Sound Income Strategies. Welcome to the Money Answer Show, David. Well, thanks for having me back. Just give a brief uh, description of uh, your uh, resume and how you got to creating Advisors Academy. Well, really, it kind of started out of luck. It was back in the late 1990s, I became really concerned about the stock market, uh, that we're going to take a turn for the worse, and that would probably last a while. Uh, and I had to change my business model to protect my clients, which, you know, to many of your listeners may seem like, well, gee, of course that's what one would do. Um, but unfortunately, most advisors didn't do that. Um, so I went to a specialty of really specializing in, like I like to call it, the universe of non-stock market income generating strategies. And that's what we've been doing now for the last 20 years of my career. So we're in a situation now we've had rising interest rates. The Federal Reserve has raised rates three times so far this year. What is your expectation of what the Fed's going to be doing going forward? Are they going to raise rates more or are they going to pause? They are going to raise rates more, but I believe they're going to slow down. Um, it's really been up until very recently, they've had no traction on the long-term end of the yield curve, 10-year bonds, 30-year bonds. In fact, it was just uh, about a week ago that the 10-year Treasury finally jumped back above 3%. But every time they raise short-term rates by a quarter, the 10-year Treasury goes up by maybe about a tenth of a percent. So those two numbers are still closing in on each other, and that's not good for the economy. So I think eventually the Fed is going to have to slow down. Um, unless we get some cooperation from other parts of the world and their central banks uh, who are easing while we're tightening. Why is it that you think that the yield curve has been flattening, meaning that short-term rates have been moving up a lot more than long-term rates? Well, it has. Um, Short-term rates have been coming up. um, It seems like every quarter point uh, that they go up, long-term rates go up by about half that. And uh, we just we haven't had a, enough cooperation on the long end. Um, you know, the difference between the two-year Treasury and the 30-year Treasury is only about four tenths of one percent. So think about that, right? You're going to lock your money up for another 28 years, right? Going from two to 30 to get four tenths of one percent. Uh, that doesn't sound very appealing to a lot of people, and so it is flattening. So in this environment now, where we have rising both short-term rates and long-term rates, though short-term are rising faster than long-term rates. Let's go through some of the uh, income uh, opportunities that you talk about, because it's it's a challenging environment with rising interest rates. I mean, you could potentially lose money in bonds. Is that is that the big challenge that you face with your clients? It is, but it's also our competitive advantage as a company, because most people who, most advisors that do fixed income type management don't do the types of things that we do uh, or do it the way we do it. Um, let's face it, most advisors today just use bond mutual funds, for example, as an afterthought. And because, you know, most advisors that are involved today with clients, they got started in the 80s and 90s, the best stock market in U.S. history. So they became stock market specialists, not, not bond market specialists. So for the first time, really, in the history of our markets, we have a a financial advisory world that's lopsided toward equities instead of debt and fixed income. So most just do bond funds. And and bond funds, of course, are extremely dangerous, much more dangerous than individual bonds when interest rates go up. Moreover, there's a lot of other mistakes I find that most people today make when trying to manage fixed income. For example, a lot of advisors today don't look beyond the Moody's or Standard & Poor's ratings. And that's a big mistake. Why? Because, you know, I'm sure you saw the movie The Big Short, correct? Right. And in that movie when, you know, they knew that these mortgages were being defaulted upon and yet all these mortgage bonds had a AAA rating, they went into the lady in the rating agency and said, it was a a great scene. They said, you know, well, what's what's going on here? How can you still keep these as AAA? And she said, well, you know, I've got to feed my family. And at the end of the day, if we don't give you a AAA, the rating agency down the street will. So that should have been a hard lesson to everyone that you can't just look at the rating agencies if you're doing fixed income. You need to look beyond that 
at their actual uh, financial ratios. And most advisors just aren't equipped to do that. So if they pass the first test, they're not utilizing bond funds, then most of the time they fail the second test in that they're, they're not looking beyond the ratings. And then there's other things that you do. I mean, first of all, if you're willing to invest two, three hundred thousand dollars a year in the right technology and expertise, any advisor can get a better price on bonds for his or her clients. Most advisors don't know how to do that. They go through their, their brokerage firm, their clearinghouse, and they have no idea how much is being tacked on to the cost of that bond. So their clients are getting a, a, a lesser deal. Um, but let's say they even pass that test, that third test. Well, the final test is that it's got to be actively managed. In a rising interest rate environment, to go to your point just a moment ago, in a rising interest rate environment, the best defense against that headwind, if you're going to be in bonds and bond-like instruments, is to be in the highest yielding bonds and bond-like instruments in a particular category and class. Um, and how do you do that? You do that by actively managing and by swapping the securities for the highest yield. So is it a headwind? Yes. But it's a headwind for everyone who does fixed income. Uh, if you do it right, it can be a competitive advantage because there, there aren't that many of us out there. So in the high yield space, are you talking about high yield corporate bonds or commonly called junk bonds is an important part of your portfolio? No, I'm not talking about high yield. Um, I'm talking about yield. Um, you know, we've got mostly investment grade bonds, preferreds and instruments like that, but not high yield. Um, you know, we do find sometimes there's some opportunities with some crossover bonds that are investment grade with one rating service and, and are not investment grade with the other or one notch below. Oftentimes there's some great opportunities there. Again, if you look at the financials and you say, gosh, they've been, you know, unduly criticized on their rating, they're double B and they shouldn't be, they should be triple B or higher. And that really gives you an opportunity to actually get some capital gains managing fixed income, especially in a, an economy like we're seeing now where companies aren't having as much trouble paying their debt as they were in years past. So you're getting the capital gains because the company is being upgraded as far as its ratings. Is that correct? Correct. Correct. And that's obviously what you hope for if you're going to try to get a gain that way. And we're not really doing it for that. We might do it because we see a little higher yield and we think it's okay to have a crossover bond. It works and it gets the yield up in the portfolio. But it's something we think there's a much greater chance will be upgraded than, for example, downgraded. When you put together an entire portfolio, we're going to go through some of the other options as well. What is a yield, a total yield, combining all the different strategies that your clients should expect realistically? Most of our clients are getting between 45 and 5% after fees. And I say most because it's all custom. We custom build the portfolio based upon people's needs and goals and risk tolerance and everything. But 45 to 5% net of fees is a good rule of thumb. All right, some other topics, uh, some other areas are preferred stocks. Uh, what do you like about preferreds and how do you pick good preferreds? Preferreds are great. Um, because preferreds are much more bond-like in most ways. You know, people say, well, why are they called a stock? Well, the reason they're called a stock is because they're perpetual, like a stock. They don't have a fixed maturity date like a bond. Um, but really, that's the only way in which they're stock-like. The reality is preferreds are more bond-like in virtually every other way, except you're picking up about 2%, two percentage points on the yield compared to a, a bond of a similar rating. Uh, which is why I'm a, I'm a fan of preferreds in the right situation. And I think, you know, when you're researching preferreds, the key is to research them like a bond. You know, don't worry about what, uh, you know, what the equity markets are doing. In fact, I, I would go back and just, this isn't what I'm about to share with you, isn't really, you know, an exact precise science that you can quantify. But when I've gone back over 20 years in this area of you know, preferreds and so on, and what I've found is, the fluctuation in price on a preferred, you know, really only less than a third of that fluctuation has to do with fluctuations in the stock market. And even then, they're very, very muted, relatively speaking, to, you know, common stocks. Most what of the some, fluctuation has to do with bonds. What, what are some of the uh, industries in which you like preferreds these days? Well, the challenge with preferreds has always been that, especially before the financial crisis, most preferreds were financial companies. Um, now, we still have a majority of preferreds being financial companies, but the percentage isn't as high as it was before. 
so when you have a combined portfolio, you always want to look at your, your bonds and say, well, okay, I can't have a lot of financial companies here in my bond holdings because I know my, my preferreds are overly weighted toward financials. Okay? Um, one of the things that saved our bacon and our clients uh, back during the financial crisis was that when we were using financial companies, uh, we used the, the too big to fail algorithm. You know, we looked at those and said, we want the ones we know are too big to fail. And as a result, we made it through the entire financial crisis with, without a default, without a missed dividend. Um, but if you go outside that, um, there are some utilities, for example, uh, that work well uh, with preferreds. Uh, there are some REITs. Um, REITs can be dangerous if you buy the common stock, but if you buy the preferred, it gives you another level of security. So those are two other sectors that I, I happen to like in the, in the preferred world other than financials. Another area is convertibles. Uh, do you like convertible bonds, and what role does that play in your portfolio? We do virtually nothing at this time with convertibles. Um, convertibles are good when the market's down because what you have with convertibles is you have basically a bond or a preferred with, an in the, with a call option embedded. And sometimes if the call option is in the money, in other words, if the stock market is up, then you'll be overpaying for that preferred or that convertible. And as a result, it, it, it adds more risk if you're buying when the market's high. So I love the non-convertibles because I don't have to worry about where the Dow or the S&P or the NASDAQ is. But if we had convertibles, that would be a concern. So wait till the market takes a nice drop, nice correction, and then we get back in using more convertibles at that time. Very good. We're going to take a break. This is Jordan Goodman of The Money Answer Show. My guest is David Scranton. He's the founder and president of the Advisors Academy and also Sound Income Strategies. You can find out more about that at soundincomestrategies.com. We'll be back after this. Become our friend on Facebook. Post your thoughts about our shows and network on our timeline. Visit Facebook.com forward slash Voice America. We've all been there. Struggling to keep up with credit card payments? Searching for a simpler, safer way out of debt? Well, here it is. Cambridge Credit Counseling is a nonprofit service that has been helping people reduce or eliminate their credit card debt for over 20 years. Most of us have made late payments and even gone over our credit limits. Before we know it, our balances are out of control and we can barely afford to make the minimum payments. If this sounds familiar and you're ready to take control of your debts, call Cambridge right away at 1-800-897-2200 for a debt-free analysis. Cambridge will work with your creditors and may be able to reduce your interest rates and get you out of debt fast. In fact, Cambridge's typical debt management clients save almost $150 every month on their credit card payments, and they're debt-free in just 50 months. So there is a simpler, safer way out of debt, and it all starts with Cambridge Credit Counseling. Call 1-800-897-2200 for your free debt analysis. Cambridge Credit Counseling is a Massachusetts-based nonprofit agency providing services nationwide. For complete licensing information, Visit them online at cambridge-credit.org. Jordan Goodman is an affiliate. He recognizes quality solutions, forming relationships to help improve the lives of his listeners. Has your small business been turned down for a loan by the bank? Is lack of capital hindering your business growth? Small businesses unable to obtain bank financing or tired of merchant cash advances can now get the financing they need. Corporate Lending Solutions provides short and long-term capital, revolving lines of credit, and unsecured business loans. Does your business need help with payables, supplies, or payroll? Corporate Lending Solutions has powerful programs to help. While getting a small business loan can be a long, daunting process, with Corporate Lending Solutions, it's simple and takes only one to three days. Call 800-261-6478 or visit CorporateLendingSolutions.com to learn more. 800-261-6478. Jordan Goodman is an affiliate. He recognizes quality solutions, forming relationships to help improve the lives of his listeners. 
Have you friended us on Facebook yet? Why not? Just go to Facebook.com forward slash Voice America or search for the keywords Voice America. Once you are part of our Facebook network, you'll receive daily messages about what's happening with our shows, this week's featured guests, and new happenings at the Voice America Talk Radio Network. And you can add your voice to the always active discussions on our timeline. Just go to Facebook.com forward slash Voice America or search for Voice America. You've been listening to The Money Answer Show with Jordan Goodman. If you have a question for Jordan or his guest, please call us now at 866-472-5790. That's 866-472-5790. Now back to Jordan. Welcome back to The Money Answer Show. This is Jordan Goodman, your host. My guest this hour, this half hour, is David Scranton. He's the president of Advisors Academy and also the founder of Sound Income Strategies. His website, soundincomestrategies.com. Welcome back to the show, David. Well, thank you. Good to be back here. So we talked about individual bonds, preferreds, convertibles. Let's talk about some other income strategies that you recommend. Uh, business development corporations, or BDCs. What are the pros and cons of those? Okay, so now we're getting a small step fancier, going from bonds to preferreds and, and ultimately preferreds to BDCs. Um, BDCs are basically like a bond fund. Now, I said earlier on that I'm not a big fan of bond funds per se, um, but the reality of it is that uh, there are times when there's, there's certain things that you cannot buy as an individual investor uh, unless you have a high net worth, um, unless you do it through a fund. And BDCs, the holdings within BDCs are one of those things. Uh, BDCs basically have different loans inside them to corporations that normally could not do an initial public offering. Maybe their companies aren't big enough or don't want to incur the expenses of going to do an IPO and float a whole issue of bonds. So instead, um, they, they borrow money privately. So a BDC is basically a fund that turns around. It's, I guess it's more like a, you could say it's more like a closed-end bond fund, uh, which raises money. The BDC itself raises money and then turns around and lends that out to small, medium-sized businesses. Um, where, where BDCs, so BDCs become a little riskier because now, because it's essentially a fund, if you will, at any given time, yeah, the price of the loan could go up and down with interest rates and, and other factors, you know, probabilities of default and so on. But moreover, uh, now the fund itself can be overvalued or undervalued at any given time relative to the value of the loan. So it's like you have another variable mixed in. The good thing about BDCs in a, a market like this where interest rates are on the rise is that a lot of BDCs, not all, but a lot of them have floating rate debt, uh, which means a lot of them that do have this floating rate debt don't have the same interest sensitivity, uh, which could drive down prices in a rising interest rate market. But you have to be careful. You know, BDCs, you're, you're loaning money to smaller or medium-sized companies. And sometimes the transparency of looking at what the holdings are in the BDC is a little bit challenging. So you really, really need to do your research within BDCs. Um, but if you're willing to do it, it could be a good thing for some part of your portfolio. Another area you look at are real estate investment trusts, both publicly traded but also non-publicly traded REITs. Uh, you had talked about uh, REIT, you t REIT uh, preferreds earlier, but is there a case to be made for publicly traded common stock REITs, both uh, traded and non-traded? Yeah, um, the non-traded REITs, I believe, are not as attractive as they were years ago. The big attraction of the non-traded REITs is, you know, they were issued at a fixed price, like $10 a share. And nobody really knew what these things were worth until they had a liquidity event, an IPO of sorts, 5, 10, 15 years later. So as a result, the managers could manage the REIT long term like a private company. They weren't uh, subject to the fickle whims of Wall Street from you know, quarter to quarter. That was an advantage. The disadvantage is there's, there's higher fees in a lot of these non-publicly traded REITs and so on. Well, the Obama administration effectively changed and took away that advantage because now there's a requirement that periodically these REITs need to have their properties appraised. And that appraisal now gets reflected directly to the client on a statement. So all of a sudden, these managers of these non-publicly traded REITs do now, uh, for a change, they do now have to be worried about uh, the public and the concerns about prices going down. 
so when you take that advantage away and make it a disadvantage and you, you look at something that's literally non-liquid, um, where if somebody wanted to sell it, they couldn't because there's no market for it, uh, I find that those non-publicly traded issues have become far, far less popular. Now, the publicly traded REITs are, are certainly there's a place for them. Um, and, you know, REITs are stock of a company that owns rental property. So you have to look at what's behind there, what's in the REIT, what kind of rental property is there, as well as the financials. So with REITs and BDCs, you have those two extra levels of scrutiny that you don't have to deal with in, in when, you, when you're looking at uh, your actual bonds or preferreds, but you do have to be careful. And, um, you know, what we do to mitigate the risk, for example, in a portfolio is we would say that the most we'll put in BDCs is maybe 15 or 20% of the income portfolio. And as a result, we'll take that and we'll actually, uh, uh, you know, limit it to that amount and we'll have five different holdings within that 15 or 20%. And on REITs, uh, we'll typically go no higher than 10% and have at least seven different holdings. So each holding is only 1.5%. That's how we mitigate the higher risk in BDCs and, and even risk higher than that, ultimately, in, in REITs. In and you're, keeping it, you're keeping it to the publicly traded REITs at this point because of what you just said. You're not doing the private REITs anymore. And even the publicly traded REITs, yeah. It's even the public, you're correct, but even the publicly traded REITs are going to be limited to 10% of the portfolio, and each holding might be 1.5%. Um, because, again, there's extra risks there in real estate. Real estate REITs are every bit as interest rate sensitive. I would say they're more interest rate sensitive in many ways than even a bond or preferred. Why? Because uh, the cost of carry on a lot of these properties is tied to a floating rate. So, therefore, the mortgage interest rate basically has gone up. And all of a sudden, the higher interest rate environment, that income looks less attractive. So, it kind of sort of takes a, a double hit. So we've been we've been significantly have reduced our holdings and REITs now over the last year year and a half, uh, waiting for the best opportunity to to get a heavier weighting into that REIT sector. Another area you look at are annuities, both indexed annuities and fixed annuities. What role should annuities play in what your pl- current client's portfolio wanting income? Jordan, I'm not sure we have enough time to talk about annuities on this show because they're, they're the good, the bad, and the ugly. They're the most controversial. Um, and unfortunately, some annuities give, give the annuity world an overly bad rap. Uh, but yeah, a fixed annuity is simply like a bank, you know, insurance company's version of a bank CD. Today, you can get 4% some fixed annuities, and that doesn't sound bad to a lot of people. Um, indexed annuities are... Similar, only the interest rate is calculated differently. So for people who want to be really conservative, who even cringe a little bit at the concept of maybe preferreds, uh, for that person, oftentimes the REIT is the better answer. Or sorry, the, the annuity is the better answer because the annuity is insured by an insurance company. Um, and the insurance companies are ultimately backed up by each state guarantee fund, depending upon the state in which the, the, the insured is a resident. So, again, for a really conservative person or somebody looking for a guaranteed lifetime income, that's the Cliff Notes version of where the annuities can fit in. Uh, and so, uh, but it's something you have to commit to for long term because there's all kinds of uh, prepayment penalties. And, and uh, if you get out of it early, you can get hurt, right? You know, it is, but it's really no different from a bond or preferred or any of that stuff because you could buy a 10-year bond or a 10-year annuity. And if you get out early, you could have a loss on the bond. You can have a penalty on the annuity. So it's really the same type of thing. Uh, in the annuity, you know exactly what that loss would be if you got out early. In a bond, it's a little bit of a crapshoot. You know, you, you, you just hope maybe that it's not down if you want to sell early. So I look at all the entire income world as being very much the same, that if you want to make money on your money, you have two choices, either go in the stock market and use risk in hopes of doing better, um, or commit to a time frame to do it in a more secure way through any of these types of instruments that we're talking about today. In roughly two minutes we have left, why don't we kind of sum up what an income investor is facing in this era of rising interest rates and how you can help them uh, do better than they probably would be doing on their own? Well, it's interesting. Most income investors right now listen to their brokers and they think all they're going to get in bonds and bond-like instruments is 2 or 3%. When they realize that they can make just about double that, 
they're often surprised, pleasantly surprised. And doing it on your own as an investor is really troublesome. Most people have never bought individual bonds outside of savings bonds. And, and, and frankly, most of them have taken the shortcut and bought bond funds. Um, but, you know, there aren't many chiropractors that become orthopedic surgeons. There aren't many orthopedic surgeons that become chiropractors. And frankly, most of each of those don't recommend the other. They, they, they think the surgeon thinks the chiropractor is a quack and the chiropractor thinks the surgeon is doing unnecessary work. Well, the reality of it is the same is often true when you talk about stock specialist versus fixed income specialist. And we know in medicine that there's a place where you need a chiropractor or a physical therapist and there's a place where, unfortunately, you might just need that surgery. The same is true with investments. So don't think that you're stock market-based advisor who has you in mutual funds or 70-80% of your portfolio in stocks is going to be able to manage the fixed income side as well, any more than the orthopedic surgeon can crack your back the way the chiropractor can. That's truly my best advice. You know, to seek out for that part of your portfolio that's in fixed income, seek out somebody like us, doesn't have to be us, but seek out somebody like us that's made that their lifelong niche. Terrific. Well, thanks so much. My guest this half hour has been David Scranton. He's the president of Advisors Academy and also the founder of Sound Income Strategies, which helps people produce income for themselves. Their website is soundincomestrategies.com. Thanks so much for being on the Money Answer Show, David. Gordon, thanks again. And we'll be back after this break. Become our friend on Facebook. Post your thoughts about our shows and network on our timeline. Visit Facebook.com forward slash Voice America. Attention heroes, current and former firefighters, law enforcement, military, medical, or educational professionals. Heroes can receive rewards averaging over $2,500 when they buy, sell, or refinance a home. Heroes come first. Along with the Homes for Heroes is the nation's largest hero reward program. Their mission is to provide extraordinary savings to heroes who provide extraordinary services to our nation and its communities every day. Learn how you can purchase a home for no down payment, no closing costs, and get money back at closing. Find out how you can own for less than you may pay for rent. Get your hero rewards at heroescomefirst.com. That's heroes, H-E-R-O-E-S, comefirst.com, 888-437-6114. Jordan Goodman is an affiliate. He recognizes quality solutions, forming relationships to help improve the lives of his listeners. If you're like me, the list of books you want to read is never ending. You simply don't have time to read them all. Blinkist has solved this problem. Blinkist is the only app that takes thousands of the best-selling nonfiction books and distills them so you can read or listen to them in under 15 minutes all on your phone. I like to listen to Blinkist while I commute to my office. The Blinkist library is massive, from timeless classics like Rich Dad, Poor Dad, to current bestsellers like Fire and Fury inside the Trump White House. My personal recommendation is to check out the four-hour work week. Right now, for a limited time, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash Money Answers to start your free seven-day trial. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T dot com slash Money Answers to start your free seven-day trial. You can cancel anytime. Blinkist.com slash Money Answers. You've been listening to The Money Answers Show with Jordan Goodman. If you have a question for Jordan or his guest, please call us now at 866-472-5790. That's 866-472-5790. Now back to Jordan. Welcome back to The Money Answers Show. This is Jordan Goodman, your host. My guest this half hour is Dee Carter. He is president of Carter Financial Group. Uh, based in Midland, Texas. Welcome to the Money Answer Show, Dee. Thank you, Jordan. I appreciate the invitation. Good to be back with you. For people who may not be familiar with it, just give them a brief bio and and, uh, tell them briefly about the name of the book that you've come out with recently. I just completed a book. It came out in July. It's called It's Now or Never, 
uh, which is a catchy n- name, uh, basically based on my musical background. But the, the, I think the real po- important part is the next part of the line. It says how to enjoy your life and not let your investments own you. And I think that's probably the most important part about the book is we're really trying to get to people that really have never, well, it's really written for three different groups. For people that have never done any planning at all, people that have started out to plan, but perhaps went down the wrong road and found out they were maybe losing money that uh, they shouldn't have to lose. And it's really written for guys like me or or people that are starting out in the business trying to be financial advisors. Uh, And they're being trained, by the way, Jordan, the same way I was trained in 1974 when I first got my securities license. And as you well know, the world has changed somewhat over the last 40 years, 40 plus years. So I'm hoping that uh, some new advisors might read the book and realize that there's, there might be a better way to do things for, for their clientele. So it's really written for those three, three groups. To make it clear, how have things changed from when you got into the business in the 70s to now where we are in 2018? Well, I think, first of all, we have a much more intelligent clientele. People can get online and learn a lot of things that we did not have access to in 1974. Nobody even knew what, uh, I mean, my goodness, cell phones weren't even around at that time. So we've, the technology has increased at such rapid advance that people can now get online, and I recommend that they do that and do some research on their own. Now, they've got to be careful where they're researching because sometimes research sources may not be exactly up to par. But that's one of the main things that I've seen change over the years is that our clientele come to us with a better knowledge of what they're trying to accomplish. They have a better knowledge of really where they are and perhaps. Um, that's number one. I think that's maybe the most important thing. The second thing is that there are a broad scope of, of products out there now, income-producing products, that we either did not have or we had kind of walked away from uh, since uh, 1974. Uh, we've been really kind of pushing the growth end of the market really, really stringently. I, a lot of the guys, that's all they ever think about is growth, growth, growth and how to become millionaires instead of how to save your money and how to make sure that your income is there. So we really have developed over the years a better knowledge of income-producing products and how they can be just as strong, basically, as as growth products and remove perhaps up to 70% of the risk factor. Those are the two main things, and that's one of the the two reasons that I wrote the book. So what are some of the income strategies that you uh, think are good today that were not available when you started in the 70s? Well, they were available, but I think people have walked away from them. Uh, there's nothing wrong with, uh, for example, bond and bond-like instruments. Uh, that's one of the things that we really, really do stress is that there are not bond funds because, as you well are aware, bond funds have no guaranteed interest rate and they have no guaranteed maturity date. So what we try to push people toward, if they're looking for income, uh, is to put them their money into a good, strong bond fund, the, or bond rather, that will pay them a guaranteed rate of interest that compounds and grows over a period of time, uh, we found that we can do that very successfully and perhaps even get them as good a return, even sometimes even a better return than they could with the stock market based on the ups and downs of the market. They're there, but because the greed factor and the fear of missing out factor have become so prevalent in, in retirement planning and in investments, People have kind of walked away from the safe things that happened years ago. I remember when I first got in the business, and this is a long time ago, Jordan, but when I first got in the business in 1971, I've been doing this now for 47 years. Uh, when I first got in, my grandfather said, you're in a business now that the only place you can find the guarantees are in the financial services that you're going to be able to offer. And, of course, he was talking about life insurance at the time. We still do life insurance occasionally uh, if it's called for, but most of our instruments now are in the bond market, uh, perhaps for preferred stocks because of the guaranteed interest rate and the guaranteed dividends that we can obtain. Sometimes ETFs, depending upon uh, exchange-traded funds, depending upon where they're uh, putting their funds and where the bonds are. But they're out there, but they've just not been talked about because people were really trying to make that quick buck, uh, get in and make their money, and uh, hopefully get out on time. But, you know, as you well know, most people don't get out when they're supposed to. Let's talk about the ETFs briefly. What are some ETFs that you like today? Uh, for producing solid income? We've been actually looking at, the, uh, our guy that does that with uh, the sound income strategies has been looking more of the, you know, toward the, the, where the bonds are the, the safest. He's, an ETF can include both triple A's, it can include uh, junk bonds, 
we're moving toward the, more the AAA area. So you can look in all the AAA areas there and find some really nice bonds. And uh, if I started naming names, I might get myself in trouble with the people. So, but I will say this: that there are AAA's out there that are very, very strong, and we're looking we're looking toward that area. And a lot of those are in commercial bonds. A lot of those are in in uh, areas that people are familiar with. They just don't know they're familiar with them. They don't. They've heard the names. They've heard the companies. They've heard the the uh, products, but they just realized uh, that they just have forgotten about it, and because nobody's brought it to their attention. So what we try to do with uh, the type of business that we do is is basically get back to the old style, which is good, sound income strategies that will provide people the income down the road. And we look at all of those. We look across the board. Our guy that does this, and, and by the way, you just had someone that's uh, uh, with, uh, with you just now, David Scranton. I've been with David for a long, long time, and we are really more interested in income producing than anything else. So we look at the kind of bonds that will that will pr- provide income. What kind of yield, without naming any names, what kind of yield can people expect from those AAA ETFs you were just referring to? I was, yeah, that's a good question. I was just looking at a client's portfolio a minute ago because I had another client in here asking about that very question. What can we expect to return? Some of those bond funds are returning up in in the five, six, and seven percent area, uh, compounding quarterly. Uh, that is an outstanding amount. Uh, we've got some some uh, uh, some of the stock funds that we got, or the, the the preferreds that are actually doing better than that, uh, and the dividends, and of course the interest rates are guaranteed in those things. So we're looking anywhere from a, a, a strong five, and we're we've been able to get five without almost any difficulty whatsoever, and uh, and sometimes even more than that, depending on where they are. So it really depends on the location of the bond, who who the bond uh, issues, and 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 how it works from there. But we're seeing five and up. We're seeing five. I've I've seen some returns, quarterly returns this last quarter that were actually in excess of eight uh, percent, and that's re- um, unbelievably good. But yeah. it's because of the way the bonds were were set up. So we have a rising interest rate environment now. Both short-term rates are rising as the Fed yes. raises rates, and long-term rates are going up. The ten-year over three percent these days. So how do you manage an income portfolio in a rising interest rate environment? You have to really watch out for your market. You really have to watch out what's available. Uh, we do some trade outs on bonds almost daily. Uh, you have to see what's coming out and what's available in the market because they come out with different rates. And what our people do, our CFAs that work, and we have three CFAs, uh, certified financial analysts that work with us, they literally watch those things every day. And that's the only way you can make it work is to trade up, trade out, trade around, and to get the, make sure you're, you're maintaining the interest rate that you're trying to achieve. So it really takes somebody that's watching it constantly. Thank goodness I don't have to watch it constantly because we have someone – with sound income strategy that does that for us. But that's exactly the way you do it. You have to manage what you've got and look daily, literally watch daily what's out there. Uh, And that's what we do, and we've been doing it quite successfully now for the last year and a half. So you have in your book what you call D's Directives, and let's just go over some of those briefly. You say to max out your 401K. Isn't everybody maxing out their 401K? Why do you need to tell people to do that? They really don't, Jordan. Uh, people don't max it out. They they think that if they can just, in fact, a lot of people just take what the employer offers. Let's say the employer is offering a 5% match. They think, well, that's great. I can uh, get 5% on my money on what I'm putting back. What they don't realize, if they put 5% back themselves, they're getting 100% on their money immediately, depending on what the market does. And they can put up to 16% in there, and I think they ought to put max it out. Now, having said that, you need to be watching where you're putting the money in inside the 401k, and a lot of people don't realize that they can actually manage where the money goes. They don't have to go into these little pigeonholes that uh, the representative kind of puts them in. I did 401ks for a long time. I literally worked with 26 401ks here in West Texas, over 6,000 employees. I spent most of my time talking to people that were really concerned, but a lot of people would just let you, we'd evaluate where they were, what their, I call it threshold of pain. A lot of people call it risk, but I call it the threshold shoulder pain when it you you put your money back until it starts hurting i guess but uh, you can manage inside you just a lot of people don't do it 
they're more concerned about the here and now. I was on my radio program myself this morning, and one of the things I was talking about was that there's astonishing reasons that people don't uh, get ready to retire, and one of those is they, they really don't focus on that 401K. They're comfortable with a withdrawal withdraw from their 401ks instead of leaving it. They re- retire or rely solely on the, re- the employer to do the thing, and they don't think that they need to get involved. Um, that is totally wrong. They need to be very much involved with their 401ks, max out what they can get is, is within reason, and, and then sit back and make sure that it works for them every year. Another thing you talk about is automating your savings plans. What do you mean by that? Well, you need to have money. I just had a man in here that talked about that. He said, how can I automate what I do? And I said, it's quite simple. We decide how much money you're wanting to put into the market or into the investment, and we will withdraw those funds from your savings account or whatever account you want to withdraw them from on a monthly basis, and you don't have to worry about it. It's going to be there every month. We're going to take it out of that account and put it, move it from one place where it's making like one-tenth of one percent and move it into something that's making you some some serious money for your retirement. So you need to automate it. If you can, you should, you, I tell people all the time, don't depend on your own memory to do it once a month. Don't depend on your wife to do it. Don't Really don't depend on any, even your advisor to do it. Make sure it's automatically coming out of one account where you're making very little money, going into another account that's designed for your retirement, and it comes out there automatically every month on the same day. Uh, that's automating your savings account, automating your plan, and we do that almost uh, weekly around here. Very good. We're going to take a break. This is Jordan Goodman of The Money Answer Show. My guest this half hour is D. Carter. Uh, he is the president of Carter Financial Group based in Midland, Texas. Uh, his new book is called It's Now or Never, How to Enjoy Your Life and Not Let Your Investments Own You. His website is carterfinancial.fixedincomecouncil.com. We'll be back after this. Become our friend on Facebook. Post your thoughts about our shows and network on our timeline. Visit Facebook.com forward slash Voice America. Attention heroes, current and former firefighters, law enforcement, military, medical, or educational professionals. Heroes can receive rewards averaging over $2,500 when they buy, sell, or refinance a home. Heroes come first. Along with the Homes for Heroes is the nation's largest hero reward program. Their mission is to provide extraordinary savings to heroes who provide extraordinary services to our nation and its communities every day. Learn how you can purchase a home for no down payment, no closing costs, and get money back at closing. Find out how you can own for less than you may pay for rent. Get your hero rewards at heroescomefirst.com. That's heroes, H-E-R-O-E-S, comefirst.com, 888-437-6114. Jordan Goodman is an affiliate. He recognizes quality solutions, forming relationships to help improve the lives of his listeners. If you're like me, the list of books you want to read is never ending. You simply don't have time to read them all. Blinkist has solved this problem. Blinkist is the only app that takes thousands of the best-selling nonfiction books and distills them so you can read or listen to them in under 15 minutes all on your phone. I like to listen to Blinkist while I commute to my office. The Blinkist library is massive, from timeless classics like Rich Dad, Poor Dad to current bestsellers like Fire and Fury inside the Trump White House. My personal recommendation is to check out the four-hour work week. Right now, for a limited time, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash Money Answers to start your free seven-day trial. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T dot com slash Money Answers to start your free seven-day trial. You can cancel anytime. Blinkist.com slash Money Answers. Have you friended us on Facebook yet? Why not? Just go to Facebook.com forward slash Voice America or search for the keywords Voice America. Once you are part of our Facebook network, you'll receive daily messages about what's happening with our shows, this week's featured guests, and new happenings at the Voice America Talk Radio Network. And you can add your voice to the always active discussions on our timeline. Just go to Facebook.com forward slash Voice America or search for Voice America. 
You've been listening to The Money Answer Show with Jordan Goodman. If you have a question for Jordan or his guest, please call us now at 866-472-5790. That's 866-472-5790. Now back to Jordan. Welcome back to The Money Answer Show. This is Jordan Goodman, your host. My guest this half hour is Dee Carter. Uh, He is a financial advisor, president of Carter Financial Group based in Midland, Texas. Uh, His book is called It's Now or Never, and his website is carterfinancial.fixedincomecouncil.com. Welcome back to the show, Dee. Thank you, Jordan. I appreciate it. So we're going through your directives. The first one is to max out your 401k. The next one was to automate your savings plans. The next one you're saying is to live, uh, not don't live within your means, live below your means. What do you mean by that? Well, a lot of people try to push that envelope a little bit. They will spend exactly what they make each month. And as, if you do that, you're obviously not going to get anywhere with your savings program and your retirement program. So what I actually tell people, to carry a little notebook in your pocket, literally every day and write down for a month everything you spend. I mean everything. If you buy a candy bar, write it down. At the end of the month, you're going to find out that you're not only living beyond your means, you're actually spending money that you could be putting at a better place, and you're spending on things that you really don't need at the time. So I tell people all the time, you, you need to learn not just within your means what you're making, but you need to learn how to live below them. That is, uh, be a little more conservative. Put money aside. Make sure you're not spending every dime you make on things that you want right now. One of the reasons that I see all the time, and I get these people come in that, that have these astonishing reasons, as I mentioned a minute ago, that they, they're not ready to retire, uh, they really depend on, uh, they're living on what they make, and they don't have a plan. They've never really sat down and sat together and put together a plan. And one of the things I really want people to learn how to do is to learn to live below their means in order to be able to put that money away, whatever percentage it may be, put that money away as young as they possibly can, because it's amazing, as you well are aware, what compound interest can do for you over a short period of time. And over the long haul, it's amazing what it can do. Money at 7% will double in 10 years. And uh, you just need to know that. And if you can live below your means and put that money away, it's It's amazing how much money you can stack up over a short period of time. And then you talk a lot in your book about risk. You say, don't ask your risk tolerance. Ask, why do you want to risk what you spent your entire life building? What do you mean by that? Well, a lot of people go into a planner and they will, they will try to figure out what their risk tolerance is. They will say, how much money do you want to have in the market? How much money do you want to have in these various places? And uh, a lot of people come up with these, these figures that, Quite frankly, they don't even know where they came from. And what I'm trying to get people to do is, is why do you want to risk what you spent your life building? Instead of building all your life and then putting it into something that, that is uh, at risk, uh, largely at risk, you should be, the older you get, the less money you should be putting at risk. You ought to be putting money out there that is secure and as safe as possible so that when you reach a certain point in time, you know you're going to have it. You're not going to have to worry about whether your money is going to, that's one of the reasons I wrote the book. How to enjoy your life and not let your investments own you. I find too many people coming in my office that have really um, put money out at risk when they're in their 60s and 70s. And you'd be amazed how many people come in here in their 70s, and I find that they're 100% in the stock market. Uh, that is, why do you want to risk what you spent your life building? Don't worry about your risk tolerance. Worry about what you're going to have at the other end. And we really want to sit down with people and explain to them there's, there might be a better way. There is a better way to guarantee their income. So don't don't ask what your risk tolerance is. I really don't care. As I mentioned earlier, I'm, I mentioned this kind of like the threshold of pain. How far can you go before it starts hurting? Well, you look up in the market like it did in 2008 and see you've lost 40 to 50 to 60 percent of your retirement package or your or your bundle that you're trying to put together. Now you're hurting. Now that's not just risk tolerance. That's real pain. So what I yeah. tell people all the time, you don't want to risk what you've spent your life building. Let's put some money back in places that will be safe for you, as safe as possible, that you know you're going to have when you hit uh, 65 or 70 or whatever that magic number is that you come up with in your own mind. Another of your directives is about Social Security. You say to count Social Security, but don't count on Social Security. What do you think is going to happen to Social Security in the long run? 
Well, if they don't do something pretty quickly, as as you're aware, things should get really bad about 2033 for the people that are going to retire about that time or later and start uh, trying to withdraw and live on that. The average Social Security check today is, is less than $1,200, and the maximum is 2788 this year. So uh, can you live on that? Not really. I, it's, it's, that's one of those rhetorical questions. When I ask the question in my seminars, can you live on your Social Security, I have yet to have someone say yes. Uh, unless you can live like a church mouse, I don't think you can do it. So what I'm trying to get people to understand is you can count on it if you're under a, a certain age, but you don't want to count it to being the all-in-all. All. It's not going to be your all-in-all. All. It's It was never designed for that, actually. It was designed to help people with, with their retirement, but not to be the whole thing. So you can count on it right now, but don't count on it in the future, because if we don't do something about it, and, uh, you know, Ronald Reagan in 1985 pushed the re- normal retirement age out to, to uh, 67. Uh, that was a stopgap. That was kicking the can down the road. Uh, if, the, if the government doesn't get together and decide something between now and, I'm going to say, within the next three or four years, we're going to see that 2033 drop to 2031 or even less. So the people that are retiring after that point in time are really not going to have what they thought they were going to have. They're going to have about a 70% or 75% of what they thought they were going to get uh, if they go to socialsecurity.gov and figure that out on their own. Uh, we've got to do something. The government's got to do something, or we're literally going to see that uh, discount hit us or hit those people retiring at that time to the tune of 20 to 25%. So what do you think the government is going to do in the next three or four years? Wow, if I boy, if I had a crystal ball, I could answer that question. I know what they generally do. They kick it down the road. That's the way the government has been uh, as long as I can remember, and I've been involved actively in most government situations for the last 45 years. They don't want to make that kind of decision because it's a job killer for a congressman. If he says he's going to change Social Security, he can almost be assured not to be reelected uh, at the next term. So what they're trying to do, there's, there's ways to do it. They could raise the tax on the, uh, at, which nobody wants to do. We're paying 6.2 now of our money up to a, to a level of about 148,000. Uh, they could raise that to 6.3, but that's kicking the can down the road again. Uh, and that means people like the, those of us who have our own businesses are going to be paying 12.6 instead of 12.4 because I pay both the employer and the employee side of my Social Security. That's one way to do it. The other way is to to raise the normal retirement age like Reagan did. Uh, he moved it back to 67. I can see them doing that before anything else probably, moving the retirement age to 68 and 69 and perhaps even as high as 70. If they do that, they haven't really solved the problem. They've just pushed it down the road for another generation to come along and solve. Uh, there are The only way to redo this thing is to start over, and I think that the way they invest the money has to be changed to, to a certain extent. Uh, there may be... They maybe have to let some of the private factors get involved, like George Bush tried to do. Uh, he was only talking about two percent, and it was a. You you remember the hue and cry that came up from that yes. situation? Yes. There there are ways to do it, but I'm not sure that any of them are viable. Now you talk about hard truths. One of your directives is to find an advisor who will tell you the truth, even the hard truth. You think a lot of advisors don't want to tell clients the hard truth? I don't think a lot of them do. I have pe- too many people come to my office and, and give me their, their advisor's story or what they've heard from their advisor, and it's mostly pie in the sky and blue sky and, and smoke up their sleeve, and they don't want to tell them the hard truth. The hard truth is simply this. You can't depend on the market to, to solve your problems. You, you, you really have to depend on yourself, and you have to really take a really hard look at what you're trying to accomplish. I really believe that, uh, and I tell my clients the truth, and they don't like it sometimes. If they come in here and say, well, here's what I've got in the market, and I'm depending on being able to draw out you know, that 4% for the old Monte Carlo method, which, by the way, just gives you a 90% chance of success. Never have like those odds. Uh, if you do the Monte Carlo and draw 4% a year, you're supposed to have a 90% chance of not running out of money. Well, that gives you a 10% chance of running out. To me, that doesn't make a lot of sense. And by the way, that 4% has been dropped by Morningstar recently to 2.7%, so that can give you some idea of why you really have to tell these people the hard truth. There is just, uh, there's, there's ways to do it, but you don't want to depend upon the marketplace to do their, your bidding for you. A lot of people are really caught up in the stock market. They think it's a, a, a do-off and end-all, and I, I don't find that it is. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm a registered rep myself. I do some of my clients, and we put some money in the market depending on their age. But at the same time, as they get older, the hard truth is 
you don't want to risk your money out there. You just don't have time. You may not have time to recover from another downturn like we had in 2008. If you're 70 years old and we have a downturn, you could be 80 before you could retire. That's just not fair. So that's hard truth, but you've got to tell them the truth when they come in. In about a minute or so we have left, you have on your cover a picture of you as an Elvis impersonator. What have you learned being a Elvis impersonator? I say that again. I, that, the question's interesting. I I was an Elvis impersonator for years, and uh, uh, because of my music background, and frankly, it's been a lot. It was a lot of fun. In fact, on my office wall, there's a big picture of Elvis uh, that someone gave me. Um, one of the things that I and I've got a lot of people that actually come to me because of my music background. They, they've heard me sing somewhere, and they come in. But I tell them when they come in, I'm not the guy in the, in the funny suit. This is a different character. You're talking to a different guy now. That was fun. This is not. This is not a fun situation. This is serious. And I really I spring off from there. I do. I, I have a lot of fun doing what I do. That was a thing I did for years, and I enjoy doing it. But that's fun. That's a game. That's. This is not a game. Your life yeah. is not a game. Your income is not a game. Your future is not a game you need to play you need to get in here and make those plans so i kind of use it from that standpoint that's really where it, it all comes from terrific well thanks so much my guest this half hour has been d carter uh he is the president of carter financial group based in midland texas his book is called it's now or never how to enjoy your life and not let your investments own you you can find out more about him at his website carter financial dot fixed income council dot com thanks so much for being on the money answer show d thank you jordan i appreciate it enjoy i hope to talk to you again sometime thanks again we'll be back next week with another edition of the money answer show goodbye for now thank you for joining jordan goodman and the money answer show if you have a question for jordan please visit his website at www.moneyanswers.com and be sure to tune in every monday at 12 p.m pacific standard time right here on voice america business see you next week